Well, we are in the middle of an Arctic vortex and it's freezing cold outside right now. But this morning, frost was outlining everything in the sunshine and winter brings its own form of beauty in a very austere way. Today, what I wanna talk about is four types of characters that are never actually mentioned in a story, but yet they're in every story. So grab your coffee and let's dig in. You're watching the Caffeinated Bible. The goal of this channel is to help you read your Bible in a much more thoughtful and interactive and engaged way. I've been teaching at seminary and graduate schools for the past 20 plus years, and what I hope to do is take what I've been teaching there and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you like it, be sure to give it a thumbs up and let other people know about it as well. Let's dig into this material. Narrative is perhaps our most fundamental form of thought Almost all of our rational abilities depend on it, and it's our primary way to remember the past, explain something to others, or imagine or think about the future. In this video, what I want to do is look at how we understand who the author, the narrator, and the characters are in biblical texts, and why this is important. And this one's going to be a little bit more geeky than last week's. Last week, I talked about how a text is like a musical score, the author was the composer, the reader was the person who performs the music and brings it back to life. And the text is like the little black marks in the musical score on the page. This week what I want to do is talk about how the composer is the author, the readers are the musicians that perform the score, and the narrator is like an imaginary conductor that leads the music while it's being played. The first point I want to bring up is that a written text is a form of interpersonal communication. In personal communication, we can pick up from the clues on the person's face, inflections, mannerisms, gestures, and based on how we respond to them, the author can then either correct or expand how we are understanding him or her. However, with the text, the author is no longer present to correct our understanding. So in a certain way, a text is cut free from its author. A text can also be read by other people. A love letter can be intercepted by a third party, or in the case of the biblical text, the audience is long since gone. And we are like interlopers eavesdropping in on a conversation that happened 2,000 or more years ago. This means that texts are much more flexible and elastic than face-to-face -face conversation there's a lot of benefits to this, but it also raises its own set of problems. The first thing we need to realize is that the issues of authorship can be very difficult to determine in the Bible. For example, who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Now, traditionally, we've got the names of them, but not one of these texts has the author identified in them. In fact, one of the distinctive traits of biblical literature is how there is a lack of authorship in almost every case. But in some cases, we seem to have a straightforward identification of who the author is. Paul's letters are a great example. In many cases, we need to do some historical sleuthing to determine who the author is. Sometimes we can have a pretty good idea, but in other instances, it's really up to our best detective work or theories. Now, because we tell stories all the time and we're very familiar with them, we understand the role of a narrator, but it operates in the background of our brain as we process stories. For example, you meet a friend at a coffee shop and they tell you about what happened that day. She tells you all about the hassle of dealing with an insurance company and how this has really put her behind schedule for the day. She's the speaker or author and also the narrator. But what if she starts to tell you a story that her grandfather told her and she starts to use older English words and sort of make her voice sound a little bit like him? Or what if she wrote her grandfather's story down for a newspaper article? Who's the narrator here? Well, she would be the author, but when she is telling her grandfather's story in his words, he would then be the narrator. 
Now the narrator is a mental construct that we use to tell stories and it's used in narrative and literature like the Bible. Every book you read was written by an author. And in almost every book, the author is not the same as the narrator. They narrate their account by means of a narrator that they employ to narrate their narration. Okay, that's a mouthful. The narrator is the person within the text that's telling you the story. The narrator determines how we look at the events, the perspective we take on them, and usually in biblical stories, our narrator is sort of a fly on the wall. They not only have a wide view of everything that's taking place, but they often know more than the people in the story itself. In this way, as I was saying, the narrator is like a figurative conductor who is now guiding the way we understand the story. Now there's three basic types of narrators, first person, second person, third person. A first person narrator is a character inside the story and they tell the reader what is happening from their point of view. And oftentimes you can pick these out because the narrator will use words like I, me, and myself when narrating the story. Often that means that the reader learns what's happening alongside the narrator or through the eyes of the narrator as it unfolds. Hearing the narrator's thoughts and feelings understand their experience in the way the narrator themselves experience them. The Psalms are perhaps the best example of first-person narratives in the Bible. For example, Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? This puts us in the place of that first-person narrator. We are there on the road, in their shoes, on that long hill leading up to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage to worship in Jerusalem. Philemon is another example. In verses four and five, Paul writes, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. Paul is writing to Philemon and in this case, it's from Paul to Philemon. And so the use of the first person narrator, I, Paul, to Philemon makes a great deal of sense. A second person narrator is fairly unusual. In second person narration, the person telling the story uses words like you to describe the main character of the narrator. I really can't think of an example of this in the Bible off the top of my head. If anyone can think of one, Put it in the comments down below and I'll take a look at it, but I can't think of a second person narration account in the Bible. A third person narrator is not part of the story and they refer to all the characters in the story as he, she, they, or them. A third person narrator is the most flexible type of narrator that can be employed in a text. This doesn't mean that a third person narrator is impersonal. The author can share the thoughts, feelings, points of views, and beliefs of the characters within the story, and more than one. They can tell it about a number of people. The third person narrator is probably the most widely used type of narrator in the Bible. In the story that we've been looking at for the past couple weeks of the healing of the paralytic in Mark chapter two, we have third person narration. This narrator knows why so many people are jammed into Jesus's house, why the paralytic friends have to climb up on the roof, the narrator steps inside the minds of the scribes and gives us insider information. What Jesus says to them and how the crowd reacts. Now the contrast between what the scribes are thinking and what Jesus says in the story is what drives the theology of that story home. Mark recounts this story by using a third person narrator who knows all and gives the reader all kinds of insights into the story information that many of the people sitting in that room would not have had. The narrator in this way sets us up for how we are to react to and understand a story, a lot like that mythical sort of conductor that I've been telling you about. It's at this point that we need to be really careful at differentiating the author, characters within the story, and the narrator. Going back to the example of sitting down and talking to your friend over coffee, 
when she's telling us about her grandfather, she is not telling us about her experience, but his experience. She is narrating his account. Now let's take an example from the Old Testament that's fairly well known for this. And it's in Genesis chapter 38. In that chapter, we have the story of Tamar, who was married to two of Judah's sons, Er and Onan. The problem is, is that the first son, Er, did evil in the sight of God. So God put him to death. This leaves his wife, Tamar, a widow. So Judah tells his second one, Onan, to take her as his wife and raise up a family for his brother. But Onan knows that Tamar's children would not be his. The implication is, is that he would be dividing his energy and wealth between his family and hers. So he sexually abuses Tamar. He would have sex with her, but then ejaculate on the ground so that she would not get pregnant. Again, God puts this man to death. Up to this point, the narrator is giving us inside information about the situation that Tamar finds herself in. Information that only Tamar and Onan would have been privy to. Now, not wanting to lose his third son, Judah tells Tamar to wait because his third son, Shelah, is too young in verse 38, 11. Now, notice here, the narrator tells us what he said. But then he goes on to give us the reason Judah said this. He was afraid the third son would die as well. The idea behind this here is that there is something wrong, evil, or cursed about Tamar. So Judah comes up with this excuse to protect his third son from her. This creates a division between what Judah says and thinks and what the narrator has told us. We know that the first two sons died because they did evil in the sight of God. But Judah thinks that there's something wrong about Tamar. The contrast between what the narrator has told us and what the narrator recounts Judah saying is what shapes how we look at the story of these characters. In verse 12, we are told that Judah's wife dies. After his time of grieving, he then goes to visit a friend some distance away. Tamar learns about Judah's trip, once again, inside knowledge provided by the narrator. She removes her widow's garments, dresses up, and then goes and sits at the entrance to a city that Judah will then pass by. She also knows that Shelah, the third son, is now an adult, and Judah has conned her in regard to his promise. In verses 15 and 16, Judah sees Tamar sitting by the gate and thinks she's a prostitute and propositions her, which makes us question his morality. And they strike a deal where he is going to pay her a young goat from his flock, and he gives her his signet, his staff, and his belt as a promise to pay when he returns. We are not told the actual juicy bits of the story, but they're implied. In verses 20 through 23, Judah actually returns with the goat to pay her, but he can't find her. And I think this is included in the story here to show us that he has at least some moral integrity. In verse 24, Judah is told now that Tamar has been immoral. Notice what the narrator is telling us here. They don't tell us that she's pregnant, but uses a highly judgmental term. She's been immoral. And the result is that she's pregnant. Judah is innocent. How can this be? How dare she? Bring her out and let her be burned. I don't know about you, but what he says there I find absolutely horrific. The narrator has set us up in the story to see a double standard being employed. First, he doesn't realize the fault of his own sons or his own culpability in this whole matter. Instead, he pronounces judgment on her that there's something cursed or evil about her. That's why his first two sons died and why he has to protect his third son. Second, we know she has been innocent, but very shrewd at the same time in coming up with a plan to raise a family. Finally, as Tamar is brought out into public and they're about to execute judgment, Tamar reveals the signet, staff, and belt. And it's at this point that Judah has a V8 moment. Wow! His final statement sums up the story 
and what we have known all along. She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her my son, Shayla. Where he saw immorality, we saw her taking a radical risk to gain what was rightfully hers. And actually, he was the person who was being immoral. Once the tables get totally flipped, he is now seen as the immoral one, and she's the righteous one. This is the perspective that the narrator takes and revealed to us as the story goes along. Narrators can also shift as we go through a story. For example, in the first 15 chapters of the book of Acts, the author, Luke, takes a third person approach. When he tells his story, it's they, them, he did this, so on like that. But then in chapter 16, verse 11, suddenly it switches to we, us. And many commentators think that this shift in narration from third person, he, them, they, to first person, we, us, indicates the point where Luke has now joined Paul's missionary band. Let's turn to the third character that are important in every single text or story, but are often not mentioned explicitly in the text, and that is readers. Now we've looked at authors as sort of the composers that write down the musical score, and then narrators as sort of a figurative conductor that leads us into how we are to perform the text. Readers are now the musicians that bring the text from those little black marks on the page back to life. Now every text will have an implied reader. This is the reader for whom the text was written, and as a result, the text will be shaped and contoured for their understanding. A few years ago, I was teaching a course and had a student that was online taking the course in a country where Christianity was heavily oppressed. When we wrote to each other by email, we used coded language to communicate. Dad instead of God, work not ministry, newspaper instead of the Bible. The student was the reader I was writing for, not the political and religious authorities that might snoop in on our email. And because we both shared a common safe language and the context of seminary, we could communicate with each other. I had a reader in mind when I wrote for them. The same thing is true with biblical interpretation. Who was the author writing to? Where did they live? What were the issues, questions, or challenges that this text was written to address? All of this is material that a good study Bible or a Bible dictionary can help you find. The biblical texts were not just written to inform readers about something, giving them sort of a report about something. The Bible is not a history book full of interesting stories, even though that is part of it. The books of the Bible were written to change the lives of their readers. John Golden Gate puts it this way. The stories were written to do something to people, and our approach to interpretation needs to be able to handle this. It's at this level of readers that all the various readers, preachers, commentators, and theologians have left their mark as to how the text has shaped them. We have a historical record of how the biblical texts have changed the lives of readers and interpreters through the centuries. And this record is not just in their writings, but in the various church movements, literature, art, and architecture that has been handed down to us. In this way, the impact that the Bible has on readers becomes part of the long tradition of biblical interpretation. Or to put it another way, each and every generation has the responsibility to apply the biblical text in a manner appropriate for their place in history. This involves knowing the contributions of those who have come before us when interpreting the text, and also realizing that our interpretations will shape how those come after us read and apply the Bible. Now, I hope you enjoyed this quick survey through authors, narrators, and readers, and how they function within the Bible and sort of our role as interpreters in being able to kind of discern between these three here. I also wanted to remind you that I am giving away Living Parables by Mark Boyer and Corbin Cole. Now, this isn't so much an interpretation or a comment or explanation of the parables. Rather, what they are trying to do is translate the parables into language and ideas today that resonate with us. So for each parable, 
They'll give three or four different ways to reframe that parable into today's language. Now, in order to have a chance to win this book, there's three things you need to do. And I'll have this in the show more section underneath the video. First off, you need to be a subscriber to the channel. Second thing is you need to have a US mailing address. And the third thing you need to do is you need to leave a comment under the video here and tell me why you would like to read this book. What I will do is then look through those comments and select the comment that I think is the best. A week from now in the next video, I'll announce who wins this book. So if you want a chance, be a subscriber, have a US mailing address and leave a comment down below. I sure hope you like these videos and find them useful. Give it a thumbs up if you like it. Be sure to subscribe and please tell other people about the channel as well. Until next week, peace.